so a budget details a country's revenue and expenditure which is very very important so more the taxes the income automatically reduces that means the consumer will not be able to consume at the same levels that was given to him now the reason behind it is that the benefits of public goods can be easily enjoyed by anyone without affecting the consumption of others Good morning and welcome to the revision in second PUC economics for chapter 11 that's on government budget and economy. Now this chapter is a very very interesting chapter so we are going to follow the agenda that is with the chapter introduction going forward I will tell you what is the chapter weightage followed by the question types the question and answers. Now what is the weightage for this particular chapter if you look here there will be two one mark questions so you can score your two marks here followed by two two marks questions so that makes it to another four marks so two plus four you have six marks one four marker so four plus i mean this is six plus four you will have ten marks coming in here plus another six marks coming up from here so that will already work you out to almost 16 marks from this chapter so just look at that total there so if you just look into this entire factor you have 16 marks coming up from this particular chapter because we have seen in the previous exams that there are certain questions which are being repeatedly asked from this chapter now let's go into the chapter try to understand what is budget all about a budget is a year-long financial report that explains how future revenue and expenditure would be calculated for a given set of items. Now we all know that we have been doing budgeting as a part of our exercise both at the home front also at the professional front. Now what happens here is that when we talk about budget in economics we are talking about a budget that the nation would be doing. So a budget details a country's revenue and expenditure which is very very important. Now this budget details that we are talking about in terms of revenue and in terms of expenditure matters a lot for all of us. Why? Because this will actually help us to understand how we are going in terms of the factors of the budget that is how much we need to spend which sector we are going to give more importance where is the expenditure that lies ahead for our country so all those things would be calculated and they would be revealed by the government to us followed by the main objectives of the budget are it is on resource allocation income and wealth distribution then we are going to talk about the public sector management economic stability which is going to be very important economic development which is also there and the employment creation why because budget is the lifeline of a country that is going to make us understand how we are going to utilize the resources judicially so that we can put the country on the track of progress so this is why budget and the budgetary system have to be carefully devised so that there is a benefit for all in the system followed by there are public goods which are distinct from the private goods and are collectively consumed. So when I talk about public goods, it might be about the parks, it might be about the defense, the transport system, the utilities. All these things are being provided by the government which is going to be used collectively by all the people in the system and they are distinct from the private sector, from the private system altogether. Followed by, there are three functions of allocations. Now, the, what we are going to talk about is on allocation, redistribution and stabilization through which we operate our expenditure as well as the receipts of the government. So, the government would get money which would be allocated to different sectors of the economy. The money would be distributed among the various sectors that are in need and there would be stabilization where the government wants to stabilize bring control over certain sectors followed by which we operated on the basis of expenditure and that of the receipts that are got by the government the receipts are the income expenditure are the expenses for the government followed by the budget gives a statement of the receipts 
and the expenditure of the government which is divided into revenue budget capital budget distinguished between the current and the financial needs and investments all together so we have a capital budget that typically focuses on capital expenditure where we're going to talk about expansion where we are going to talk about what are the needs of the country in terms of growth and then we also have a revenue budget which talks about the areas of income that the government would be getting in now with that we also move into the growth of revenue deficit which is actually a percentage of physical deficit point to the deterioration in terms of the quality of government expenditure involving in lower capital formation. So somewhere you might see that the government is not able to get exactly the income that it wanted. That might be because of the shortcomings in terms of the revenue budget. There might be areas where government would have expected that they would make an X amount of money but then they have not got it so all those factors may be considered as the shortcomings altogether followed by the proportional tax the autonomous expenditure the multiplier and the uh, the tax factors the reduction factors all that have been spoken about which will matter a lot when we start talking about the factors of the budget now we also talk about proportional taxes which are a part of the autonomous expenditure multiplier because taxes will reduce the marginal propensity to take from that of the income. So more the taxes, the income automatically reduces. That means the consumer will not be able to consume at the same levels that was given to him. Followed by public debt is burdensome if it reduces the future growth in terms of the output factor. So this is also very, very important for all of us. The public debt is also considered to be a very big burden altogether. Why? Because the public debt will actually put the government under a severe stress conditions at any given point of time. So we don't recommend the public factors coming up in terms of the debt here. Now we also see that more the public debt then automatically the future growth of the country will also get affected because money has to be allocated for it. With this, let's move to the exam corner. One of the most repeated questions that has been asked in economics in this particular chapter is, what are public goods? So public goods are one which have two important factors, namely non-rivalry and non-excludable in nature. So whenever we talk about this, that means these are the goods that are provided by the government for the common benefit of the people. So this would include public parks, roads, street lights, all those factors which will give common benefit to each and everybody in the system followed by who are free riders non-paying uses of public goods are known as free riders which means to say that suppose the people who do not pay anything and they use the government property are supposed to be called as the free riders free riders are the people who will never be paying anything for the usage of the government utilities moving further we're going to talk about what we mean by public provision public provision means that they are financed through the budget and they can be used without any direct payment so this is already being financed through the budget it is there in the budget you don't have to worry about it and they can be used without any direct payment from the consumers now the other one is the progressive tax progressive tax is a tax system in which the rate of tax increases as the income increases now, this is a kind of a capitalistic thinking that I would like to bring in, in terms of economics. Why? Because as the income of the country increases, the revenue of the country should also increase. So what does the government do is that they bring in a progressive tax system through which the tax rate will keep on changing as the income increases. So the higher the income, higher would be the income tax through which the government would be able to take some scrutiny. They would be able to take in some revenue altogether. Now followed by what are the revenue receipts? Revenue receipts are the receipts, the government which are non-redeemable. That means they cannot be reclaimed from the government. So these are pure income factors for the government. You cannot go ahead and reclaim it back. So the government is going to make use of this receipt as a direct source of income for them. So that's why they are called as revenue receipts. Followed by, what is the meaning of capital receipts? which create liability or reduce the financial assets are capital receipts. 
For example, what, whenever we borrow money from the external or from the internal factors, that's from RBI or from any other foreign institutions or like IMF, World Bank, we call it as capital receipt. Why? Because that is a liability for the government to repay the amount. So that is why we call them as capital receipt. The main thing here is that it will reduce the financial asset. That means that will bring down a stress onto the factors of the government where they have to pay back at any given point of time. Followed by, look at the two mark questions that we are going to look here. The one is difference between public production and that of the public provision altogether. So one side the word is provision, the other side it is production. Provision means you are going to be financed through a particular budget and can be used directly without in terms of any kind of other payment you can directly use it. The other side when the goods are produced by the government we call it as production. So two distinct words that we have to keep in mind one is production other one is provision altogether. Provision means it is already allocated through the budget so you don't have to worry about it you can access it directly without any payment there on the other side when the government produces the good you call it as production followed by who are free riders the free riders are here the people who will make use of the system people who will take care and use of all the government goods that are already been allocated as a part of the system and sometimes it is no way that you can go ahead and collect a fees here it's almost like a free part that has been given by the government for the utility of the public. So anybody who uses the government utilities for free is called as a free rider. Followed by, let's try to distinguish between surplus budget and deficit. The word itself gives us the meaning and answer very clearly. The word first here is surplus which means to say that if the anticipated revenue by the government that is the expected revenue for the government is greater exceeds than the anticipated expenditure that means we are on surplus in a very simple term to put across if the income is greater than expenditure then we will call it surplus budget if the income is lesser than that of the expenditure then we will call it deficit budget now you can see here if the anticipated expenditure is more than the anticipated revenue or the income then automatically this would become a deficit budget altogether followed by Let's go on to why public goods must be provided by the government. Now there are certain reasons why people ask this question. Why is that the government should provide public goods to us? Now the reason behind it is that the benefits of public goods can be easily enjoyed by anyone without affecting the consumption of others. Which means to say that here nobody is affected. Now let's say that you have a private car. Now you will not give your car for somebody else to enjoy. On the other hand, when a bus is being released by the government as a public transport, then you don't have to ask anybody's permission. Everybody can make utilization of that transport for the common benefit. So that's where the government goods actually come in as a boon from the government itself saying that this can be used for the consumption of the public. The second thing is that no individual can be excluded. It's available for all and that's a very very important thing. Because when we start talking about exclusivity in the system or in the economic factors altogether, then there will be only a particular section of people who will get benefit and the other section would be left. So where if we bring in public goods, that means everybody will have the access and everybody will get the benefit out of it. Followed by, does the public debt impose a burden? Now this is also an important question in the four markers. Why? Because public debt means the borrowings of the government to meet the deficit factor altogether. Now that would be always a burden. Why it is a burden? Let's think about it for a while. Now if you take a loan from the bank, until you repay the loan back to the bank, it is going to be a burden on you. 
similarly for the government in order to meet their expenditure in order to meet their goals they have to borrow money from different sectors from different walk of life so they might borrow it from the public they might take it from rbi they might also take it from imf from world bank from different sectors all together but at the end of the day what will happen here is that to meet the expenditure they have taken the burden of borrowing money externally or internally so that will definitely put the government under stress and they have to repay it back which means the stress will again come back to the citizens in the form of taxes so the government has to now increase the taxes collect more revenue from the public so that they are able to give back that loans back to the respective sectors so this is why the burden will increase in case of the public debt coming into picture followed by we will also see that when because of the higher taxes we will see that there are in fact in terms of the national income coming into picture or there might be a reduction in the disposable income the consumption might also come down so all these factors are quite bound when we talk about the public debt system followed by the sixth mark question that i would like to talk about which has been repeated is the classification of receipts now there are two kinds of receipts revenue receipts that are the receipts which are non redeemable in nature that means tax non tax revenue component that might be personal income tax or corporation tax gst all these things are a direct revenue for the government which means to say that these are the points where the government would collect money directly into the account so the government would not give away here government would try to make sure that they collect the maximum when it comes to the revenue receipts so revenue receipts in short are the income channels for the government from the different sources followed by other taxes like wealth tax gift tax that are never bought in larger amount of revenue but still they would also be considered as paper taxes why because they might be at some point of time becoming a collectible for the government but then these are the kind of factors that you will see that they get dividends they get lot of other factors in terms of loans and other things that have been lended which would be a revenue for the government the next one is the capital receipt what is a capital receipt the government also receives money by the way of loans from the sale of its asset all those receipts which will create liability for the government that will also create a stress on them why because the borrowings will create a pressure on the government as they have to repay back now the borrowings can be internal and external so borrowing from rbi or taking loans from any other sector those are all coming under the capital receipt where the government has to repay back either by the sale of an asset or they have to repay by collecting tax from different segment or different kind people all together so this is where we are talking about the capital receipts in factor with this i come to the end of the session i hope and believe that all the points discussed in this particular chapter will be of great help to you both in terms of practicals also in terms of your examination in the upcoming session we will be discussing about chapter 12 in macroeconomics that is open economy but until then stay tuned stay blessed and stay enlightened forever thank you once again for joining me on this wonderful session